Well, hi, wherever you may be. This is Mike Hinkson, and welcome back to Unstoppable Mindset. We're glad you're here. And we have a guest, Delmer McLean, today. Delmer has a master's in social welfare work, and he is also a person who happens to be blind. So we have some things in common there. And Delmer has had his share of life experiences and adventures, and we'll get to talk about some of those. Uh, And you'll get to meet him and kind of learn about him and maybe he'll inspire you a little bit. So Delmer, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Glad you're with us. Oh, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about your life growing up and were you born with outside? Were you born blind? I actually, I was, I was born, uh, um, I was born blind. Uh, I had, um, what I was told anyway, is that I had, uh, um, congenital cataracts and other issues. Now, the congenital cataracts, they weren't dealt with in the same way when I was uh, young as they are now. Of course, I was uh, born in 1973, and I had, I had um, I, basically up until about 1977 or 78, I had uh, five operations, you know, five eye, eye operations within that period. Um, and that allowed me to um, obtain partial vision in one eye. So, um, so technically, I'm not totally blind now. Obviously, um, I have um, enough vision right now that I can, um, you know, I can get around. Um, I, you know, I can take public transit. I can walk. I, you know, read large print. I have larger fonts than my computer. Um, but to give you context there, I had my first eye operation, I think it was in January of 1974. So um, yeah, so between about 74 and 77 or 78, that's when I had my series of five uh, eye operations. And I had one last eye surgery in 2011, uh, wherein I, uh, there was a, an intraocular lens implanted in my uh, better seeing eye, right? Because when I had uh, my surgeries back in the early 70s, the process, at least as I understand it for children, was not to take out, you know, the the, the lens that was, um, that had the cataract and, re- and replaced it with anything, right? They would just remove the lenses and then often you would, um, they would use, uh, you know, glasses, right, with, with strong magnification to, you know, if, if there was any vision to that could be uh, maximized. So how, how yeah. so how has cataract surgery changed over the years? Well, I think nowadays, uh, you know, if you can um, have the, the intraocular lenses uh, put in your eyes and, and often, you know, a person can have fairly normal vision, you know, like it's a result of the surgeries, but because of the, the type of uh, surgeries they did when I was younger, you know, there was, uh, I think, I'm, I'm not a medical expert, so correct. I mean, I don't, I don't, I have to be careful what I say here, but I think that there was more of a risk of, you know, scar tissue being mm-hmm. left behind. And that's what happened uh, in my other eye, which I essentially to see blur, right? I, pre- I pretty much consider myself as being blind in that eye because it's really, there's nothing there that's of use, you know, to do anything. Um, and that's what happened there. There was a, a, there was some scar tissue that was left behind that the uh, surgeon uh, uh, couldn't get. And, and, you know, even in 2011, uh, the surgeon that was that I was working with, he said, "Yeah, there was no in no real sense of you know trying to do anything with that eye." He said, "I we could try to uh, implant a, le- a lens in there, but he said I don't think it would really make a difference. It wouldn't really give give you anything." So, of course, surgery, and, and I'm not a medical expert either by any standard, but I would think that surgery has changed now to where there is a lot more specific pinpoint surgery they can do and a lot that they can do with lasers that they weren't able to do 40 and 50 years ago. Yeah. But just in my case, so they're saying at this point, it's not, it wouldn't give me anything more than what I have. I mean, as it it was uh, in 2011, when I had the lens put in my, my, in my, my seeing eye, so to speak, um, 
the do one of the uh, physician's assistants, uh, when I went for my post-surgical checkup, he said, oh, I'm sorry the surgery failed, you know, and your vision's so poor. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I thought it was great because I had been wearing really uh, thick glasses, you know, for most of my life. And now, of course, I feel like I have a little bit more vision than what I had with the thick glasses. Um, so, so to me, it's an improvement. Uh, they're telling me basically now uh, getting any type of eyeglasses won't really help me. Um, but I, I think it's kind of great not to have to wear, to wear glasses. And it's weird because now sometimes people don't even know that I have, you know, that I have low vision. And uh, so I'm kind of excited that I can walk around without glasses and, and I don't, I don't uh, you know, consider it uh, a failure. So I guess it's uh, all uh, perspective. It is one of the, the constant things that we tend to see, and you you summarized it very well with what that, that woman told you, which is, I'm sorry that we failed and you can't have more vision. And the, the problem in the medical, the optical industry is, it's a failure if they can't restore your eyesight, rather than recognizing that eyesight's not the only game in town. You know, exactly. They, yeah. And that exactly. makes it it makes it so unfortunate that we see that so much. And that contributes to the myth that if you're blind, you can't do anything. And, and that'd be my question to you. What if you yeah. tomorrow lost the rest of your eyesight? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I mean, I, I can't say that I wouldn't be, you know, have some measure of disappointment for sure. I be, but but I feel um, in in my in my view in this, of course, probably um i have worked for uh cnib the canadian national institute for the blind um their um vision loss rehabilitation um area um so i worked uh for them for a number of years and uh, so i'm you know i'm well aware of how one can compensate for partial vision, no vision, you know, there's ways to work around it. So um, of course, I, I think I would have some measure of disappointment because I don't, I don't actually remember having no vision because I was so young, but I know that I could work around it. Like, I don't think to me, it doesn't have to be, oh my goodness, I'm blind. I might, you know, I'm, 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 life's not worth living. And trust me, I have worked with people who were at that point, you know, where they, they thought, you know, the idea of, of going blind, it would be the worst thing ever, or even, you know, having partial vision, then well, what can you do when you're blind, you know, it's over, right? Where, so I, I certainly don't think that way. I, uh, my view of disability is, you know, it's something that you, you can work around, right? It, it, you, you have to look at strategies to help you just to go around it, you know, kind of like you, um, might have to go around, you know, a fork in the road, right, or an obstacle in the road, you know, and, and, and people, I think we all um, function differently um, to a degree anyway, right? So, uh, like you said, it's, it, it does, it's um, having no vision or less vision, it doesn't have to be thought of as, as a deficit, you know, it's, well, the problem is, though, that society treats it as a deficit. And yeah, so let me yeah. let me suggest this. And yeah. we've talked about this on Unstoppable Mindset before. My proposal and my submission is everyone has a disability. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that people with eyesight all have a disability. And to use your terminology, they've worked around it. That is, they're light right. dependent and they don't know how to function without light. Thomas Edison and the people who invented the electric light bulb worked around their disability, but make no mistake, it's still there. Yeah, and yeah. as soon as as soon as you lose power, as soon as you learn light, lose lights, people run for candles, flashlights and other <laughs> things, so that they can see what to do, which they may or may not be able to find technology to temporarily offset that disability. It's I there. Agree. But we don't, we, but we don't make the leap to say, okay, but there are people who are that way all the time. Why should we treat them different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, and I, as you meant, as you were were talking about that, I, I can think of instances where I've, let's say, I've come, you know, home to my condo with a friend who's totally sighted, right? And we 
go into the in the doorway you know and it's dark and they're i noticed they're having a fit because oh you, you put the lights on right and i'm kind of just you know <laughs> walking <coughs> excuse me walking around my condo in the dark you know till i i till i eventually get to where the you know light source is and turn the switch on right but i noticed they're they're panicking you know there's no light there's no light right and i'm kind of um chuckling to myself you know these guys really need light it's not that hard to get around you know but dark right you can feel your way and of course you know um pretty familiar with with my own house right so i know where things are um yeah um but i, I know what you're saying society has this idea that you especially with with vision right that you can't do anything without vision um whereas i think those of us who have vision loss or really any type any type of disability know that we can we can work around it if we're creative and that's i had a colleague uh, at cnib um years ago who would say that you know we have to be creative if we have vision loss you know to work around it and he, he was totally blind and he actually said it was honorable to i remember he said it was honorable to have vision loss that's what he used to say well, the problem is, I suppose, and I'll put it that way, we do have to be creative because society has as yet not chosen to be inclusive. The fact right. is that society should recognize that we all need different tools to function in life. And the fact that I may need some slightly different tools than a totally sighted person might need doesn't change the fact. And we, we can't seem to get away from that. So we're forced to oftentimes be a lot more creative than we otherwise I might agree. need to be. And we, we have to go do things differently, like on the internet. It is, it is a challenge to go to a lot of websites that aren't very accessible. And one of the reasons I joined Accessibe in 2021 was to help promote a concept that as it increased and improved and, and was enhanced, would make more websites accessible in a, in a very scalable way. But the fact is that websites can be made accessible, whether it be through artificial intelligence and remediation or just manual coding. And even so, less than 2% of all websites are accessible today because it reflects the attitudes of society. Right. I find we, and, and, and I'm not, before I say this, I'm not saying this is easy, but I think we, as people with vision loss have to be um, continually advocating for ourselves and others. I think we have to be willing to speak up and say, you know, this, this, the way we're doing things right now isn't working, but here are some solutions that we can use. And I know that, that sometimes people get offended by that, or they, they, you know, they, they, they um, get a little bit, um, yeah, a little bit defensive, right? When we're when we're trying to say that something isn't working and here's a better way. But I think that's the only way to help things to move forward is if, if we continually, um, you know, continually being vocal and, and advocating and, and trying to educate people in terms of what can be done and the fact that vision loss doesn't have to be a total obstacle and that you can work around it and we all do. I mean, and we all and we all have to. Yeah, advocacy is is something that more and more we all have to do to to get things done. Um, in this country, there are lots of political debates raging. Yes, um, and you've got a lot of evidence that most of society may view things one way, and Congress views it another way. Right, and even advocacy tends to have major challenges because you've got 500 uh, up to 537 people that just have decided no this is the way it's going to be no matter what 80 or 90 percent of the population believes and right. at the same time we we can't give up advocating for ourselves and advocating for what we need to have because it's the only way that we're going to make any progress and get to be part of the dialogue right. of society right. It sounds like Canada, right, where I am. I mean, not, not, you know, a little bit different political structure, right, but uh, similar issues, you know, I, I think. Yeah, it is. It is the, the same sort of thing. And yeah, the political structure is different to a degree, but the 
the political leaders, sometimes in quotes, um, don't listen to people no. and they think they know more. And, you know, that is true down the line. As you said, some sure. people can get offended when you advocate and say, well, this system isn't working for a person who happens to be blind. Here's a better way. And they get offended by that because they don't think that we really know or yeah. can know what we need for ourselves because obviously we're blind. We don't know anything. And the other thing, though, I think the other factor is that they have a different lived experience because they they often they don't have a disability. They've not maybe not associated with people with disabilities, so they don't really know what's possible. I actually had a professor uh, when I was in university suggest to me that there is no discrimination toward people with disabilities because we have government legislation to prevent that. And I had to really try not to just sort of laugh in his face i was really trying to bite my tongue and think what the heck is this guy talking about i yeah. mean i'm sure i know he meant well but really you can so he, do you really think that just because government enacts legislation that that things go away like so for example if government enacts legislation does discrimination you know toward persons of color go away you know does are, are, you know, issues of poverty immediately solved because the government enacts legislation. To me, that's right. such a, a naive idea. But that, to me, that was because he didn't have lived experience of, you know, living uh, with a disability, right, and trying to um, navigate various aspects of, of society, various institutions. One of the, one of the yeah, things that we, one of the things that we try to do with this podcast is to stir people's curiosity to maybe look at some of the things that we talk about, like what you're, you're talking about. Your professor is an interesting example. And it's all too often the case, oh, there's no real discrimination because there are laws. Tell that to women who aren't hired for yeah. positions or tell it to the um, women professional soccer league in this country that works as hard as men and just now has pushed to get a contract that says that they're going to get equal pay right, and equal right. visibility. That is as discriminatory as it gets. And right. um, that, the, that there wasn't a contract for all these years. And the reality is that it, it does go back to societal attitudes. And you're right. A lot of people tend not to have the life experiences that some of us do. But their life experiences also teach them they have the answers. And that's what right, needs right. to change. True. I, I agree. I agree. And your idea, you know, as you said earlier, that people with vision loss or with disabilities in general don't know what they need, right? Because we're, we're somehow, you know, we have this deficit, right? And we need to be taken care of. I mean, I think that that needs to be changed. Uh, I know that. I don't know what your experience has been, but but I know sometimes when you know people find out that I that I have a graduate degree and that I own my own place and that I you know I live on my own, you know people are say things like, "Oh, that's wonderful! You have a you know you have a job and you live on your own and you own your home," and but they always have to attach on the end of that, given your challenges. Given your so challenges, thinking, yes. I'm thinking like, what the heck does that mean? I had a doctor who. Uh, while I was doing my, my, actually when I was doing my last eye surgery in 2011, and he told me that once I had uh, the lens implant, my I'd have a normal life. And I thought to myself, what the heck is this guy talking about? You know, because even at that time, obviously I was, you know, I had my master's, I was working full time, you know, and I mind you, I didn't own my own home at that time, but you know, things come along, right? I mean, but otherwise, you know, my life was, I thought fairly normal. So I, I, again, I had to bite my tongue and, and try not to laugh at this guy. What, what the heck are you talking about normal life, you know? And sometimes I feel like saying to them, well, that's wonderful. You went to medical school. You know, how did you do that? You know, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it, it is amazing. So what was it like growing up on Prince Edward Island where sure. you're from? Um, it was it was interesting. Um, PEI. It's uh, it's very uh, community oriented, uh, I guess, both in, in good and maybe bad ways. Uh, the good, of course, is that 
you always have, I think, support of your friends and family, and it's that's fairly uh, a very fairly tight knit type of community. Now, the challenges there, of course, are that you you have to be careful that you uh, you, you if you do something that um, peeves someone off, right? Or like, especially for example, in your um, in the business world, it's going to really come back to to hurt you because of because of the smallness of the community. We're, we're of course talking about a province of, I think it's 150,000 now. I believe is what the population is. So if you do something that that um, you know um, you have a bad experience in an employment setting and you're you know you're looking for other jobs, that's pr probably going going to make it hard for you to to move ahead in terms of your career, right? Because so many people know one another. So that's a little bit a little bit of the drawback there. Uh, but overall, I, I you know I I found growing up there to be um, to be I guess successful for me. I mean I I didn't really have any major um, drawbacks. Now I think when I was growing up, I really didn't think that PEI was any different from any other place. Uh, I I didn't understand um, the fact that you know there there wasn't much anonymity there you know given the small size of the population for example uh, when I left the island it was hard at first to get used to living in in larger centers where you know people don't really uh, get as much in, involved in your life you know they're not looking at what the neighbors do because uh, uh, I, I noticed like if I go back east to visit back home to visit because of the smallness people are more interested in you know in what their neighbors are doing or if their neighbors are having trouble you know and and sometimes uh there might be a little more of a tendency to you know to talk about your neighbors right whereas i don't know that that happens as much in bigger centers and i don't say that i don't mean to poo poo pei in any in in any way it's a it's it's a great place in many ways but i also recognize that there are some limitations given its size. Uh, oh, it's, thing, it's small yeah. and, and the size yeah. is what it is. It is an island? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. So you uh, also so didn't got... dare walk too far in one direction or you'd be in trouble. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, you have to. Uh, it's it does, still does take several hours, you know, to, to drive across it. So, sure. uh, yeah. So, but I mean, you're, you're talking about... Um, so the main um, urban area there, of course, is Charlottetown, and I think it's about uh, sixty thousand people now, and that's uh, mo what that's where most of the population lives. So than that, it's mo there's another small uh, city, I think that's around fifteen thousand. That's Summerside, uh, but other than that, there are a lot of you know rural towns, and so it is very much a rural a rural province. Not you know nothing wrong with that, right? It's just just I think it's just accepting. Um, what it is, right? When right. wherever you are, right? Accepting what it is. Uh, now, one other uh, challenge that I found that I did find growing up there, of course, was in relation to having a disability, right? There aren't as many uh, accessible features that you would find in larger centers. Uh, we do have uh, a transportation system now in Charlottetown, but once you get outside of that, there, you know, you're, you, you're having to use a car. So if you can't drive or you, you know, don't have a partner who drives, you, you're going to want to, you're going to pretty much be staying in Charlottetown. Uh, so like, I, I think now I just, you know, I love, I, I still love the place. Cause I mean, obviously I grew up there and I still have that attachment to it, but I also recognize the limitations that it presents for me sure. in terms of what I want to do in my life. Do you still have family there? Uh, I have some cousins there, um, but mo like uh, my parents are gone, you know, um, sisters and their sisters and brothers. Um, there are some of the, some sisters and brothers of, of my father's family that are still around, but um but my my parents had me when they were older, so mm -hmm. like they were in their early forties when they had me. So, did did you have any siblings? No, no. So you were an only child. Yes, yeah. Which also had its experiences and and sure. and challenges and and blessings, I suppose, in a way. Well, I used to joke that, and and I mean, don't 
don't take this really seriously, but I'd say kind of in a sort of a funny way that, well, being an only child, I tended to get, I tended to get what I wanted, right? Because I didn't have any siblings to compete against. I remember uh, my my friend and his brother, you know, they sometimes when they fought over things, I would think, man, I'm glad I'm an only child. <laughs> and I don't mean when I say that I got what I wanted, I don't mean that I was spo spoiled and demanded a lot, right? But it's just that I, you know, I didn't have to, I figured I didn't have to worry about a brother or sister and, and you know, fighting with them. <laughs> well, you went to, to college and and did all those things. Yes, yes. Yes, I did my my undergraduate degree in uh, actually psychology and world religions. For a while, I was having trouble deciding whether I wanted to exclusively do psychology or, or world, world religions, which I was also interested in. So I decided to do a, a double major. I did that at the course at the University of uh, Prince Edward Island. And then after I finished my honors in psychology, I went off to do my master's uh, in social work uh, from Wilfrid Delorier University, which is uh, in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. What what made you go into social work and get a an advanced degree in MSW? Well, when I was a growing up, in social work. Yes, yes. Well, when I was growing up, uh, when I was involved, I was of course a client of the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, and they hooked me up. Um, this is how I remember it anyway. I was, it was pretty young, uh, probably 10 or 11, maybe. They hooked me up um, with a gentleman who was totally blind uh, through a, a summer program. And of course, we became, we became good friends. He, um, as an adult, uh, retrained to become a social worker. And uh, well, I was his friend and, and, you know, he was mentoring me. He, he went back to school. He finished his his um his psychology degree i believe it was he was studying and also then he did his masters in social work and you know during that time obviously i was thinking about okay what could i be when when i grew up you know and i knew that i you know i couldn't do something where i'd have to drive a car right i couldn't be a bus driver or i wouldn't be a, a an airline pilot or something like that but i think my through my friendship with him I saw him, you know, doing his doing his university degrees and, you know, and working and I thought, well, gee, you know, here's a guy that has, they can't see anything, right? And he's doing all these things. Uh, so obviously, if he can do it, I can do it. And I don't know, I think just through his mentoring and learning about what he did, I figured that's, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, so, so of course, I did it. <laughs> of course, now with societal attitudes slowly changing, uh, maybe you could, at least if you were living down here, you could go off and be a bus driver or whatever, given the way most people drive down here, I don't see the problem. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I sometimes think that here where I am too, in, in, in Barrie, you know, sometimes I'm crossing the street, you know, and I, of course, have the green light and I see someone barrel through the intersection. I'm thinking, gee, do you not know that when someone, the pedestrian's in the crosswalk, you, you're supposed to stop, you better go back and take your driving test again. <laughs> Especially when the light is in your favor, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, but you still obviously, you know, have to be careful of that because I guess uh, yeah. not everybody obeys the traffic laws, even if they have a have a driving license. My point exactly, <laughs> and it seems to be happening more and more. People are impatient. People want to do what they want to do when they want to do it, and everything else be damned, as it were. And that's sure. unfortunate. Sure. It, it, you're. Well, you're not maybe not old enough to have have lived in a time to hear the terms of things like defensive driving, where people really looked out for each other. But that is that is a concept that it seems to have dropped by the wayside over the years. Yeah, no, I do remember that con concept because I was thinking that the other day here when I was out walking, I said, "Wow, these drivers are really offensive now." You know, they're 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 they they want to get to where they want to go, and that and that's you know that's that's it. Yeah, and I think they might drive. You know, I I I shouldn't say this, but part of me was thinking, you know, perhaps they would just run if you were in the their way, they would just run into you and keep going. Oh well, I've got to get here. So no, nah, I mean that's maybe a little bit. I shouldn't say that. That's a, a little bit extreme. But, the the but problem is, I'm not sure that's always true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <So>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, things things can happen, but you got your master's in social work. Yes. And what did you then do? 
Uh, well, I, you know, of course, I spent a little bit of time looking for work. It was a little bit challenging initially. Um, I, I, I nomadically, if you will, moved around the country a little bit. Uh, I, I started, of course, in Kitchener Waterloo, where where I got my master's. Um, no, I'm sorry. I actually, I actually briefly went back to PEI, tried to get work there. It just wasn't happening. So then I, I decided I'd go back to Kitchener Waterloo, and I did that. I worked for a really small agency for a few months, which um, um, basically as a, a human, um, sorry, what am I, I'm trying to remember what the title of my, my job was there, sort of like a, an information resource type of worker where I um, helped people with disabilities to um, access resources and, you know, and, and I helped them with issues around advocacy. I did, that was a very, very, very small agency. Uh, so I worked there. And when was that? Oh, that was way back in 2004. Okay. Um, so I did that for a little bit. And then I, I got a, a job with um, a community counseling agency there, a contract position. And I was there for about a year. Um, and then after that, I, I decided I'd, I'd, I'd try Calgary, Alberta. So I moved there. Um, I worked for a bit um, for an employment counseling agency. Um, that was interesting. Um, and uh, then I actually I ended up um, back. I ended up back in Kitchener for a while, and then I ended up in Halifax, where and that Halifax is in Nova Scotia is where I I started with uh, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Um, so I was there for a while, which led me actually to Barry, um, where I continued to work for CNIB for about eleven years. Um, until unfortunately, no, I, I should mention that um, when I was at CNIB, I was doing uh, mostly service coordination and counseling work, you know, dealing with um, clients who uh, were new to vision loss, right? So, mm -hmm. so helping them uh, adjust to, to vision loss um, and access appropriate uh, rehabilitation services. So I did that up until 2019, and unfortunately, I was uh, I was part of a union, and there was a cut made to a certain position, and and you know, when someone else was allowed to uh, to take my position, it was uh, you know, I guess they call it bumping. Uh, so, so then I, yeah, so so then I had to to look for something else, and I uh, started working with uh, the company I'm with now, which is LifeWorks. And they're a uh, they're an international uh, EAP company, apply employment assistance program. And I do um, I'm a counselor with them, so I do telephone counseling. So I've been there now. Well, actually, it'll be next month. It'll be three years. Hmm. So the union didn't tend to protect you much. No, no, and I think uh, yeah, and of course, where I am now doesn't have a union and. You know, it was funny because before I got a unionized job, I thought, oh, you know, union's great, union's great, right? And you often hear that, that, uh, you know, the union is the be all and end all. But yeah, but it just goes to show that uh, you can, you, your job is still not guaranteed absolutely 100% if you're in a union. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have union dues and all of that too. Um, I'm not saying, you know, that unions are, are totally bad either, right? I'm just saying right. there's there's no guarantee a hundred percent, you know, just because you have a union that your your job is um you know, your job is um what's the word I'm looking for? You know that that, that, that you can never yeah one hundred percent secure that you can never lose it. And 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 it probably shouldn't be that way because if somebody which I'm not saying is true for you, but if somebody isn't doing a good job, um, we hear a lot of times that they they tend to get protected a lot. And, right, um, right. you know, we look at look at the George Floyd case and the police cases and a lot of the things that have happened down here yeah. where clearly someone did something they weren't supposed to do. And unions defend it no matter what. Um, right, right. Where do you where do you draw the line on that, too? Right. And the other thing I find, too, sometimes with unions is some employees will just say, well, you know, that's my job and that's it. I'm not doing anything else. That's, you know, leaving a little bit outside of the scope of my job. You know, they, 
I'm just doing what I have to do. This is what the union says I have to do. And sometimes I think that um, in the old days, you know, we, we, we really, maybe we really needed the protection of unions, but sometimes, sure. sometimes, you know, unions can, can, we, you know, they can ask for maybe more than what's, re what's really needed. You know, there can be some, some, uh, a little bit of greed there too. Not saying, I'm not saying that all unions are bad. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to generalize, but oh, sometimes certainly there not. can be those challenges, right? No, absolutely not. You don't want to do that because unions can be very and are very helpful in a lot of ways. Sure, there's, sure. there's a lot there's of value to balance. Yeah. There does. Yeah. Well, you have lived in a lot of places in Canada. What's your favorite place to live? I knew you were going to ask me that. And everybody asked me that. And what I would say that it's it, it's really hard to pick one place and say, that's my favorite place. I think every place I've lived has had things that I really liked and then things that maybe I didn't like as much. Um, and I think that what I've learned from that is that no matter where you are, there are going to be positives and negatives. Yeah. You know, there's never, there's never a perfect, um, you know, you can have your cake and eat it and every, everything's, everything's roses, right? I mean, I think wherever you are, it's what, it's what you, you make it, you know, if you, um, look at making your life positive and, and having a positive attitude, you'll succeed. But if you, uh, if you say, oh, this isn't like where I was before, why are they to do these things this way and not the way it was done in my hometown? And this is wrong. And, you know, and you're, you're not going to en endear yourself to the people there. Right. And you're going to, you're going to have trouble, um, acclimating and into the society so I, I i think it's just what i've learned is every like i say every place has positives and every place you know things that you really like right and, and then there's going to be drawbacks things that you that maybe you're not as fond of in every place and just um yeah just have a good attitude and be happy where you are and try to align yourself with the things with the things that that you like and and just try to have an open mind and you'll you know, you'll, you'll have a good, good experience there. I, I like I, living in different places and seeing different things. And I hear exactly what you're saying. I grew up in a little town about 55 miles from where I live now. I grew up in a town called Palmdale, California, okay, in the, right, in the Mojave right. Desert, Southern California. Oh, wow. right. And it was a small town. We only had about 26, 2700 people in the town. Oh, wow. And as we drove around Southern California, occasionally we went through this little town called Victorville, which was a, hardly even a blip on a radar scope compared to Palmdale's 2,700 people. Right, right. And I grew up and went to the University of California at Irvine. I've lived in a number of places and, and have good memories of Palmdale, but also never wanted really to move back there hmm. because I found other places that I enjoyed. Well, and ultimately, in 2014, we were living in the San Francisco area in a town called Novato, which is in actually Marin County, just north of San Francisco. Right. And because of an illness my wife had and so on, we decided to move closer to family. And we ended up finding property and building a home in Victorville, California, which used to be a blip on the radar scope. But when we wow. came to Victorville in 2014... There were 115,000 people living here. Okay. Wow. Well, it, as I said, is 55 miles from where I grew up. And, you know, uh, there, are, there are things that are good about Victorville and things that, that we don't tend to like, um, but there are things that we do like. And most important of all, we have a nice home here. We built a home because it's easier to, when you have property to do it, build a home when you need to make it wheelchair accessible, which we needed to do for Karen. Right. Because if you buy a home and modify it, it's so expensive. So yeah. every place you go is what you make of it. And I hear people talking all the time about how horrible New York is and they wouldn't want to live there. And they say that New York cabbies are dangerous and so on. My wife actually pointed out once when we were in New York and we were in, a, in our car with a friend. And Karen said to our friend, look at the New York cabs. You never see any of them with dented fenders and all dinged up. 
the reality is they're good drivers. Now yeah. they honk their horns and they get impatient. And that's part of the New York mystique, I suppose. But right. they don't they don't tend to crash their cabs and have all sorts of dinged up cabs they're taking care of. And they drive, they really drive pretty well. Now that was a while ago, and I don't know about right. today, but the best thing to do in New York is to take public transportation anyway. <laughs> I, I've never been to New York. My mother was, and she my mother didn't really like big cities, so I asked her about New York. Oh, big city, you know. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it would be that's some place I would like to go someday. Um, I'd like to see, I'd really like to see Madison Square Garden because uh, my one of my my favorite rock band, Led Zeppelin, uh, played mm. there in, in 1970. Well, they played there a lot in the 70s, right? But I'd love to see to see MST, and uh, I, I don't know. I think I think it'd be neat just to you know, walk amongst the tall buildings there and the excitement, there's a lot going on. So I think eventually, eventually, uh, at some point in my life, I'll probably, you know, go there for a visit. There is a lot going on there. It's a wonderful place to be. Uh, Karen said, if we ever had to move back to the New York area, although we lived in Westfield, New Jersey for six years, so we we're about 40 miles from New York and took the right. trains in. Although when she went in, she drove, she said, if I wanted to had to live back there. I'd want to live in New York City and hmm. maybe expensive, but rent an apartment because you don't need a car to get yeah. around. And even she in a yeah. wheelchair doesn't need a car because public transportation is accessible. But there is so much there and so close. There's a lot of culture in New York City. And, and I've see, lived. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Right. I was going to say, like, the, then see, that's, I think that's, well, I, I think not to keep dwelling on, you know, disability related issues, right? but I feel like as a person with a disability, I value being in, in a large center where there's really good transit, like you say, where you don't need a car, where you can, you know, hop on a bus or a subway or whatnot and, and you know, and, and go easy, move easily between destinations. And that's, for example, PEI, right? You don't have that because it's mm -hmm. small. And I think what happens is when you try to point that out to people who live there who say don't have a disability, they don't really get it. And I think they maybe take it as, you know, like you're putting their place down while be one because you're pointing out that it doesn't have a lot of transportation because they can hop in a car, right? And they can drive, you right. know, these long distances between venues. Um, so for them, maybe they think, oh, the big city, it's, you know, too noisy and there's too many people and there's too many big buildings and everything's congested together, right? Whereas, you know, I guess to us, right, we see the value of, wow, you can, you know, you can, you can get to so many places so quickly and, and with so much ease and you don't need to own a vehicle or worry about driving. I just wanted to, to add that in there. I didn't mean to interrupt you. but And, and those big buildings. Uh -huh. If you walk around a lot in a city like New York, then you start to wonder what's going on in there. I want to go yeah. see. And yeah, that's true. Somewhere. That's true. And, and it's a lot of fun. But, you know, not every large city has the same level of access and public transportation. And sometimes there's strong resistance. I remember when right. we moved to Westfield, we moved just before they started modifying the train station in Westfield to make it wheelchair accessible. Hmm. So when we first moved there, you would, if you were at the train station waiting for the train, the only way to get on the train is they have built in stairs on the train. They're very steep. You go up three steps that take you probably up over four, well, not up over four feet, but close to it, mm -hmm. three feet or so, no more than that. And, and you get in the train. So wheelchair access didn't exist there. And when, the New Jersey Transit organization said, we're going to make this accessible. There was a lot of opposition to it. Why don't you just hire people to be at each station in case somebody in a wheelchair comes and you lift them on yeah. the train, forget yeah. the liability and the dangers of doing that, especially in the rain right. um, and, and other things. There was a lot of opposition to it, even though it was the right thing to do. And one of the arguments was, well, if you put in these ramps and so on, then we have to run up the ramp, run across the sidewalk and get on a train. And if we're there at the last second, we might miss the train. I mean, there were all sorts of excuses right, right. That, that people would give rather than saying, why don't we want to be inclusive? Right. And the reality is that 
it didn't make a difference to people's access to the train from a standpoint of the average walking person getting on the train. They still got on the train. They made it. But it also, once it was done, made it possible for people in chairs to yep. get on the train and be just as accommodated as everyone else was. Yeah. Well, it's like if that's the same thing as if you look at just slope curbs, you know, at the street corners, right? Like it doesn't just benefit someone in a wheelchair. It's easier for walkers. So you're not stepping down like a steep curb really abruptly, you know, or, or, or you know, a parent with a child in a stroller, you know, it can roll up and down those easily. Like, so, so really, it really benefits everybody, right? Sure, it does. And the reality is, that is so often the case. And a lot of the technologies that blind people use could certainly benefit other segments of society, but we tend not to think about that. Why right. aren't we using voiceover and the voice technology in iPhones a lot more yeah. in vehicles yeah. than we do to make us not need to look at touchscreens and so on? Um, there are yeah. so many examples that that are out there. Well, and, and on one of the episodes of Unstoppable Mindset, we interviewed a woman, she's known as the blind history lady, Peggy Chong, and she told the story of how the typewriter was originally invented for a blind countess mm. uh, to be able to communicate privately. Right. An interesting story. And there yeah, are a lot of examples yeah. of that kind of thing. For sure. And I was, as I was also thinking of just how, um, you know, most um, transit authorities now, you know, you have automated announcing on the bus, you know, announcing the stops, right? And of course, originally, of course, I'm thinking of, of people with vision loss, but uh, that also, I think, can, ben can benefit people maybe who's, you know, um, maybe, if, you know, English isn't their first language and maybe they struggle a little bit with reading English, right? But they're better at hearing it, you know, and people that are just more auditory in, in terms of perception, right? It can be it can be beneficial for them, you know, um, maybe even people who, you know, can't read, right, but they can, but they can hear the stop, oh, here, you know, I, you know, I get off now, right, so, right. so yeah, it's, it's beneficial to more, you know, to all kinds of segments in, in society, yeah. So, what is the, for you, from a standpoint of having a master's in social work and so on, what's the most challenging part of being a therapist? I think um, the most challenging part, uh, I think, is, and and I'm you know I'm, I'm learning to do to do this. Um, um, what am I trying to say here? I, 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 I'm better in terms of doing this than I was initially. But I think the the most challenging part is not to think that you have to give the person all the answers. Uh, it's really you know you you. You listen to what they say. You 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 know you're reflecting back to them what you hear them uh, saying their concerns are. You know you, you're making suggestions about things that could be helpful. But in the end, it's for them to do the work. You know, and if they don't do the work, you have to be careful not to um, take the blame for that because sometimes people will try to project that blame back on you. You know, if, if they if they don't do the work they need to do, you know, they might uh, um, say, you know, they might come back to you and say, oh, I'm still, you know, I'm I'm feel I'm still feeling stressed. My, you know, I'm not I'm I'm um, not finding any answers here. You know, what kind of a therapist are you, right? I mean, they they might not, you know, uh, directly come out and say that so much. Maybe that's an, an extreme example, but sometimes people will try to put the blame on you if they haven't moved forward and it's because they they haven't they haven't done the work you know for example um if you talk about self-care sometimes you know a person will be really stressed out right and they won't have a a very uh, good uh, balance between work and personal life and you'll suggest to them you know the, the importance of taking time to take care of themselves you know to do things they find that are relaxing and enjoyable so they're so they get some diversion from the stress of work but then they don't do it right and then they come back with you with the same the same challenges you know but they they get sometimes people can like i say get frustrated with you but they haven't really tried to put the strategies in place that you you've suggested so you have to be just careful not to take that on um 
So I think as a therapist too, I really have to know um, how to take care of myself, right? How to make sure that I'm that I'm getting some diversion from my work, right? When I'm not working, so that I so that I don't burn out. Does that does that make sense? What I'm saying? It, to you? it does. It, yeah. it does, and you do have to really take care of yourself too in all that yeah. you do. Yeah. And you you need to step back yourself sometimes and look at how's this affecting me and how do I deal with it. Right. And I think um, the other thing I've noticed as, again, as a person with, with vision loss is I've had to find a creative way to, you know, to work within the electronic structures that they have, you know, for, for note taking and effective ways to do my notes. And for example, um, you know, as challenging, as challenging as it can be, I make notes while I'm talking to people, you know, and I mm -hmm. I'm halfway done of my, you know, my notes when I'm done sessions. So then I just have to, added things because it it tends to take me longer to do paperwork so I can't necessarily leave all my paperwork till after my sessions because then you know I'd be working all the time right uh, have you looked but, at have you looked at doing things like recording sessions or maybe having a microphone and letting a computer transcribe the conversations I thought about that I mean it's uh yeah I'm still some of that's I guess still a work in progress um um but yeah, those, those are things I, I have thought about. So far, what I'm doing seems to be working for me. Um, but like, I, I'm, I'm not, um, my mind isn't, isn't close to, to alternative suggestions like that. Mm -hmm. You've said, uh, and some of the information we've I've learned about you and so on, and looking at your bio that you subscribe to the social model of disabilities. Can you yeah. tell me more about that? Sure. So basically, so historically, right? I think we've we we sub, we subscribe to the the medical individual model of disability, right? Where where a person is seen as having deficits, right? And there and the deficits are kind of their problem, right? To deal with, right? That per, you know, for example, well, um, you know that 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 person you know is in a wheelchair. That you know that's too bad, right? But that's you know that's their that's the deficit they have, right? Or that person's blind or so on, right? Whereas the, the social model of disability, uh, I first um, learned about that, um, you know, in, in graduate school, I, I was uh, reading um, works um, by Ald, Ald, Alden, uh, Alden Chadwick in, in, in the UK. And he was talking about the, the social model of disability where disability, it's seen more as a reflection of the, you know, the limitations in society, right? The barriers in society. So someone in a wheelchair is, is considered disabled if there isn't a ramp to allow them to, to get into the building, right? Or or someone who is blind, right? We, we, they would be considered more disabled within the context that, you know, if there's not... Um, um, voice to text software, right? There's that, that maybe they're the, you know, the company that they're working, that they want to work for, they, they want to offer them jobs, right? Job ask, access with speech, you know, so that they, they can, you know, use the computer just like someone who has total vision. So in other words, so the disability is more of a, um, more of a reflection of the limitations in society than it is the, 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 physical limitations within right. the person right so that's why i like that model you well know. you know and and as we advance in technology we're we're finding more and more ways to address some of that if people will choose to do it so for example exactly. for blind people probably one of the more significant overall technologies in the last seven or eight years is ira i don't know whether you're familiar with ira um I've heard it's, of it, but I'm not as familiar with it. So Ira is a, what's called a visual interpreter. And the, the, the way Ira works is that you run an app on your phone, which activates a connection with a trained agent. And the okay. operative part yeah. about that is trained. The agent can see whatever the phone camera sees. There are other technologies that you can add to it. Like if you're sitting at your, your, your desktop or laptop, you can 
um, activate something called Team Viewer, and the IRA agent can actually right. work right. on your computer and fill out I'm forms. But the, I- team viewer. Yeah. But, yeah. but the idea of IRA is that what you're able to do is when something is visual and you can't use, um, you can't do it yourself, there is a way to activate a technology that allows someone with eyesight who is trained to come essentially in and help you, which means you still get to do things on your own terms. Going through airports and traveling around can be very helpful. There are other technologies like Be My Eyes that do the same thing. I was going to mention that one. Yeah, that's the one I was, as you were talking about that, that's the one I was thinking of. Except the problem with Be My Eyes is that the agents are are, are volunteers and, and there's not the level of training. Whereas with Ira, not only are agents trained and hired because they demonstrate an incredible apt to be able to describe read maps and other things, mm-hmm. but they sign non-disclosure and confidentiality agreements so that blind people using Ira can do uh, tax work. They can use Ira in doing um, work on their jobs. There are lawyers who use Ira right. to look at documents for discovery. Right. And Ira is okay for that because of the level of confidentiality and absolute restrictions that agents are under. So what happens in Ira stays in Ira, if you will. Right. But it but it means that I have access that I never used to have, which is really kind of cool. And then you've yeah. got access and you've got technologies like Accessibility, which uses in large part an artificial intelligent widget mm-hmm. that can help make a website a lot more usable than it otherwise would. It's not the the total solution for complicated websites, but the technologies are making things better, which is really cool. Yeah. And yeah. what we need to do is to get society to accept more of it. I was just going to say that to, you know, to, to educate people more about these things and get them to accept it. So, so you don't hear things like, well, you know, a blind or partially sighted person couldn't do this job. Right. Because, you know, then they just sometimes you hear things like that. Oh no, you know, that person couldn't do this job, right? Because they don't, they don't know about all these uh, technologies that are, are available and that it's actually not a really costly big deal thing, you know, to, to make the, the work environment more accessible. I have used Ira to interact with touch screens, right? Mm-hmm. So um, the agent can direct me as to exactly where to push to activate something that's on a touch screen, which is cool. Yeah. Be able to get hot chocolate out of a fancy coffee, hot chocolate <laughs> tea machine, you know, for example. Right, right, right. So you have hobbies, I assume, like anyone else. What the last yeah. question for you is what's your hobby? Uh, well, one of my hobbies is uh, I like to fool around on the guitar. Uh, of no, course, no. you like Frank Zappa. What else could you do? <laughs> well, I, I make noise mostly, right? I mean, I, I, I can't say that I'm a really proficient uh, musician, but I, I just, I just like to play to, to, to play around with it just to relax. Um, I'm also, um, um, also not currently, but I have in the past and I tend to return to this is, uh, um, I've been a member of, um, Toastmasters International. So I enjoy, I enjoy, uh, public speaking and, uh, um, so, so Toastmasters International, it's a program where you learn, uh, leadership skills, you know, like uh, public speaking, meeting presentations, you know, organizing different projects. Um, but I, what I really like about that is the the, the mentoring aspect of it, um, helping others uh, in, improve their public speaking skills and leadership skills, uh, guiding others. Uh, so that's another um, hobby that I that I've had, and I, I plan to to return to that. I kind of I drifted away a little bit during the pandemic because they, you know, they were doing a lot yeah. of um, um, remote meetings and I don't know, I prefer, I prefer in person. Uh, I found that after sitting on a computer all day for work, I didn't feel like doing that. <laughs> evening too, right? Um, but yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. I, um, I also, let's see, what else am I into now? Um, I, I like to do volunteer work. I'm, I'm um, on the accessibility advisory committee for one of my local uh, school boards. And uh, of course, what we do is uh, work with the school board to help to improve accessibility for students and staff who have disabilities, you know, within within the uh, 
the schools of, of the school board. Um, so that, that's interesting. We have several meetings each year and we also do during non uh, pandemic times, right? We do uh, audits in the school board within the schools, right? So we tour schools and we, we help to point out areas uh, where um, things could be made more accessible. You know, like for example, um, color contrasting on steps, uh, making washrooms more uh, physically accessible for students and staff and, you know, using wheelchairs or, you know, canes or walkers, things like that. Um, uh, you know, so it's, it's, uh, that, that also keeps me, me busy too in my spare time. I enjoy that. Keeps you out of trouble. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure, for sure. And some of the simpler things I enjoy, I, I love to walk, right? So I love to be, I, I always, um, it's funny, my friends, uh, always want to offer me rides here and there right but so i just i just like the simple thing of you know walking to the grocery store walking to mm -hmm. do my errands just going for walks i like to i like you talked earlier about uh you know looking at buildings and wondering what people are doing in there i do that when you said sometimes when i just there's some apartment buildings in my in my neighborhood here and I, I walk by these high rises and think, oh, who lives in there and what are they doing? You know, the same thing with the houses. Or just, you know, you, you, uh, you hear the birds, right? And you, you see people driving by in their cars. And I don't know, I, like just, I just like to notice those things. It's relaxing. They're driving and they don't take time to smell the roses, as it were. Well, and, you know, and that's funny because I think of that, you know, when I think about the fact that I that I can't drive, I think in some ways I think I'm lucky, right? Because I notice my driving friends, that's all they do, right? They drive everywhere. And then it's like, oh, I have to go to the gym. But I figure I do so much walking that that's my, that's my yeah. exercise. I feel like I'm, I'm healthier. There you go. So you see it as positive. Well, it is. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's a lot to be said for walking and, and slowing down sometimes too, and not rushing everywhere. Um, right. I uh, wish we all would do sometimes a little bit more than that. Well, yeah. this has been fun. If people want to reach out to you and maybe engage in, in more of a chat or learn more about what you do, how can they do that? Sure. Um, well, you could reach out to me. In my, my email address is Delmar, D-E-L-M-A-R-M-A-C-L-E-A-N. So Delmar McLean at gmail.com or you can find me on Facebook if you like. I'm on there. I can't say I'm not on Twitter or any of these other uh, social media platforms. I always joke I'm I'm almost 50, so I'm a little bit old school. Um, <laughs> so mostly it's the email or the Facebook. You know, you can certainly reach out to me um, if you like. Yeah. Hey, whatever works. For sure. For sure. Well, um, Delmar, thank you very much for joining us today and giving us lots of insights. I hope that people have found this interesting and that people will reach out. Um, and oh, my, my pleasure, Michael. Thank you for having me. It's been, it's been fun. I think we've all gotten a lot to think about from it, you know, you and me and everyone listening. And I hope lots of people of are. As always, I would appreciate it if after this episode, you give us a five-star rating. And if you'd sure. like to reach out to me, um, whoever you are, feel free to do so by writing me at michaelhi at accessibility.com. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I -E at accessibility, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com. Go listen or go look at our podcast page, michaelhinkson.com slash podcast. And Michael Hinkson is M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N.com slash podcast. But again, wherever you listen to this, please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate it. Because of all of your comments, we were the February 2022 Podcast Magazine's Editor's Choice. And I want to, again, thank everyone for that. And Delmer, especially, I really appreciate the opportunity to have met you and to have you on the podcast and really appreciate you being here. Yes, and it was an honor for me. I thank you for, for uh, asking me to... Uh you know, to, to come on. I, I, I've really, I've really enjoyed it. And, and, and again, it was a pleasure. My pleasure as well. And let's stay in touch. We will. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.